Chapter 17 of The Giver. Today is declared an unscheduled holiday. Jonas, to his parents, and Lily, they all turned in surprise and looked at the wall speaker from which the announcement had come. It happened so rarely, and it was such a treat for the entire community when it did. Adults were exempted from the day's work, children from school and training and volunteer hours. The substitute laborers, who would be given a different holiday, took over all the necessary tasks, nurturing, food delivery, and care of the old, and the community was free. Jonas cheered and put his homework folder down. He had been about to leave for school. School was less important to him now, and before much more time passed, his formal schooling would end. But still, for 12, though they had begun their adult training, there were the endless lists of rules to be memorized and the newest technology to be mastered. He wished his parents, sister, and Gabe a happy day and rode down the bicycle path looking for Asher. He had not taken the pills now for four weeks. The stirrings had returned, and he felt a little guilty and embarrassed about the pleasurable dreams that came to him as he slept, but he knew he couldn't go back to the world of no feelings that he had lived in for so long. And his new heightened feelings permeated a greater realm than simply his sleep. Though he knew that his failure to take the pills accounted for some of it, he thought that the feelings also came from the memories. Now he could see all the colors and he could keep them too, so that the trees and grass and, grass and bushes stayed green in his vision. Gabriel's rosy cheeks stayed pink, even when he slept, and apples were always, always red. Now, through the memories, he had seen oceans and mountain lakes and streams that gurgled through woods, and now he saw the familiar wide river beside the path differently. He saw the light and color and history it contained and carried in its slow-moving water, and he knew that there was an elsewhere from which it came, and an elsewhere to which it was going. On this unexpected casual holiday, he felt happy as he had always had on holidays, but with a deeper happiness than ever before. Thinking, as he always did, about precision of language, Jonas realized that it was a new depth of feelings that he was experiencing. Somehow, they were not at all the same as the feelings that every evening and every dwelling, every citizen analyzed with endless talk. I felt angry because someone broke the play area rules. Lily said once, making a fist with her small hand to indicate her fury. Her family, Jonas among them, had talked about the possible reasons for, for rule breaking and the need for understanding and patience until Lily's fists had relaxed and her anger was gone. But Lily had not felt anger, Jonas realized now. Shallow impatience and exasperation, that was what Lily had felt. He knew that was certainty because now he knew what anger was. Now he had in the memories experienced injustice and cruelty, and he had reacted with rage that welled up so passionately inside him that the thought of discussing it calmly at the evening meal was unthinkable. I felt sad today, he had heard his mother say, and they had comforted her. But now Jonas had experienced real sadness. He had felt grief. He knew that there was no quick comfort for emotions like those. those these were deeper, and they did not need to be told. They were felt. Today, he felt happiness. Asher! He spied his friend's bicycle leaning against a tree at the edge of the playing field. Nearby, other bikes were strewn about on the ground. On a holiday, the usual rules of order could be completely disregarded. That's kind of like our culture too, right? Like when it's a holiday, you can break some rules. What are some rules that you can break like on Thanksgiving? Your diet. Your diet, that's right. It's Thanksgiving, I can eat whatever I want, okay? <clears throat> He skidded to a stop and dropped his own bike beside the others. Hey, Ash, he shouted, looking around. There seemed to be no one in the play area. Where are you? Pew! A child's voice coming from behind a nearby bush made the sound. Pow, pow, pow! A female 11 named Tanya staggered forward from where she'd been hiding. Dramatically, she clutched her stomach and stumbled about in a zigzag pattern, groaning. You got me, she... You got me, she called and fell to the ground, grinning. Blam! Jonas, standing on the side of the playing field, recognized Asher's voice. He saw his friend, aiming an imaginary weapon in his hand, dart from behind one tree to another. Blam! You're in my line of ambush, Jonas! Watch out! Jonas stepped back. He moved behind Asher's bike and knelt so that he was out of sight. It was a game they often played with other children, a game of good guys and bad guys, a harmless pastime that used up their contained energy and ended only when they all lay posed in freakish postures on the ground. He had never recognized it before as a game of war. Attack! The shout came from behind the small storehouse where play equipment was kept. 
three children dashed forward, their imaginary weapons in firing position. From the opposite side of the field came an opposing shout, counterattack! From their hiding places, a horde of children, Jonas recognized Fiona in the group, emerged running in a crouched position, firing across the field. Several of them stopped, grabbed their own shoulders and chests with exaggerated gestures, and pretended to be hit. They dropped to the ground and lay suppressing giggles. Feeling surged within Jonas. He found himself walking forward into the field. You're hit, Jonas, Asher called from behind a tree. Pow! You're hit again! Jonas stood alone in the center of the field. Several of the children raised their heads and looked at him uneasily. The attacking army slowed, emerged from their crouched positions, and watched to see what he was doing. What's going on with Jonas? What's he experiencing right now? PTSD. PTSD. Okay? Because those memories and things that he's receiving from the giver are so much like reality that whenever he experiences anything that's even close to warfare, it kind of triggers him to kind of... So he has PTSD now. Yeah, to have that emotional effect. Yeah. yeah, well, it's not just the memory. So the memories that he's receiving are like he experienced them firsthand, right? So if you know anyone that's been in wartime, they will oftentimes come home with PTSD, you know? And, and small things like loud noises or like the playing of video games, or it could be anything. Yeah, it could trigger them for that that PTSD. And so Jonas is watching, walking up on like a game of war right now. Okay, do you know what PTSD stands for? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, post-traumatic, sorry, post-traumatic stress disorder. Very good. Okay, so you guys are familiar with it. In his mind, Jonas saw again the face of the boy who had lain dying on a field and had begged him for water. He had a sudden choking feeling, as if it were difficult to breathe. One of the children raised an imaginary rifle and made an attempt to destroy him with a firing noise. Pew! Then they were all silent, standing awkwardly, and the only sound was the sound of Jonas's shuddering breaths. He was struggling not to cry. Gradually, when nothing happened, nothing changed, the children looked at each other nervously and went away. He heard the sounds as they rided their bicycles and began to ride down the path that led from the field. Only Asher and Fiona remained. What's wrong, Jonas? It was only a game, Fiona said. You ruined it, Asher said in an irritated voice. Don't play it anymore, Jonas pleaded. I'm the one who's training for assistant recreation director, Asher pointed out angrily. Games aren't your area of expertness. Expertise, Jonas corrected him automatically. Whatever. You can't say what we play, even if you are going to be the new receiver. Asher looked warily at him. I apologize for not paying you the respect that you deserve, he mumbled. Asher, Jonas said. He was trying to speak carefully and with kindness to say exactly what he wanted to say. You had no way of knowing this. I didn't know it myself until recently, but it's a cruel game. In the past, there have... I said I apologize, Jonas. Jonas sighed. It was no use. Of course, Asher couldn't understand. I accept your apology, Asher, he said warily. Do you want to go for a ride along the river, Jonas? Fiona asked, biting her lip with nervousness. Jonas looked at her. She was so lovely. For a fleeting instant, he thought he would like nothing better than to ride peacefully along the river path, laughing and talking with his gentle female friend. But he knew that such times had been taken from him now. He shook his head. After a moment, his two friends turned and went to their bikes. He watched as they rode away. Jonas trudged to the bench beside the storehouse and sat down, overwhelmed with feelings of loss. His childhood, his friendships, his carefree sense of security, all these things seemed to be slipping away. With his new heightened feelings, he was overwhelmed by sadness at the way the others had laughed and shouted, playing at war, but he knew that he could not understand why without the memories. He felt such love for Asher and Fiona, but they could not feel it back without the memories, and he could not give them those. Jonas knew with certainty that he could change nothing. Back in their dwelling that evening, Lily chattered merrily about the wonderful holidays she had had, playing with her friends, having her midday meal out of doors, and she confessed, sneaking a very short try on her father's bicycle. I can't wait until I get my very own bicycle next month. Father's is too big for me. I fell, she explained matter-of-factly. It's a good thing Gabe wasn't in the child's seat.
A very good thing, Mother agreed, frowning at the idea of it. Gabriel waved his arms at the mention of himself. He had begun to walk just the week before. The first steps of a new child were always the occasion for celebration of the nurturing center, Father said, but also for the introduction of the discipline wand. Now Father brought the slender instrument home with him each night in case Gabriel misbehaved. But he was a happy and easygoing toddler. Now he moved unsteadily across the room laughing. Yay, he chirped. Yay, it was his way of saying his own name. Jonas brightened. It had been a depressing day for him after such a bright start, but he set his glum thoughts aside. He thought about starting to teach Lily to ride so that she could speed off proudly after her ceremony of nine, which would be coming soon. It was hard to believe that it was almost December again, that almost a year had passed since he had become a 12. He smiled and he watched the new child plant one small foot carefully before the other, grinning with glee as his own steps as he tried them out. I want to get to sleep early tonight, Father said. Tomorrow is a busy day for me. The twins are being born tomorrow and the test results show that they're identical. One for here, one for elsewhere, Lily chanted. One for here, one for else. Do you actually take it elsewhere? Father, asked, Father Jonas asked. No. I just have to make the selection. I weigh them, hand the larger one over to a nurturer who's standing by waiting, and then I get the smaller one all cleaned up and comfy, and then I perform a small ceremony of release, and he glanced down at Gabriel, and then I wave bye-bye, he said, in a special sweet voice that he used when he spoke to the new child. He waved his hand in the familiar gesture. Gabriel giggled and waved bye-bye back to him. And somebody else comes to get him, somebody from elsewhere. That's right, Jonas Bonus. Jonas rolled his eyes in embarrassment at that at the nickname that his father had given him. Lily was deep in thought. What if they give the little twin a name in elsewhere? Like, oh, maybe Jonathan. And here in our community at his naming, the twin that we kept here is given the name Jonathan. And then there would be two children with the same name and they would look exactly alike. Sorry, they would look exactly the same. And someday, maybe when they were six, one group of sixes would go visit another community on a bus. And in the other community, in the other group of sixes, there would be a Jonathan who was exactly like the other Jonathan. And then maybe they would get mixed up and take the wrong Jonathan home. And maybe his parents wouldn't notice. And then she paused for breath. Lily, mother said, I have a wonderful idea. Maybe when you become a 12, they'll give you the assignment of storyteller. I don't think we've had a storyteller in the community for a long time, but if I were on the committee, I would definitely choose you for that job. Lily grinned. I have a better idea for one more story, she announced. What if actually we were all twins and didn't know it? And so elsewhere, there would be another Lily and another Jonas and another father and another Asher and another chief elder and another father groaned. Oh, Lily, he said, it's bedtime.